With Nikon, you're going to hit the menu button and this is going to give you access to kind of the full list of all the options in the camera. Nikon organizes the menu into several tabs. You can see the tabs listed here into pretty logical areas. And so if you think real carefully about what that feature is, you'll figure out which tab to, do, to find it under. Now, the way to navigate through this tab is definitely using the multi-control tab on the back of the camera. And you'll be going up, down, left, right. You'll hit the OK to enter, or you could hit the right to enter. And so if you want to enter something, you're going to the right. If you want to exit and get out, you're often going to the left. Now, you'll notice there's a question mark down in there, which means if you want more information about what you're looking at, hit the question button and it will bring up a little bit better description of the feature that you happen to be looking at or the option that's available. One of the things that kind of messes me up with Nikon cameras is that you can't see everything in one look. You sometimes have to scroll down to the bottom of the screen. So it's just like a web page. Not everything might be on the first glance that you take a look. Take a look, see if there's a scroll bar, and you may need to go up and down with that multi-controller to find what you are looking for. All right, so first tab. Make your way to the playback menu, because we're going to start at the top line here. And we're going to go through these, all these items, line item, just to talk about them a little bit. The delete key is the same as the garbage can button on the back of the camera. So if you want to get rid of your pictures, you can do one, you can do all of them, you can delete everything from a particular day. So it does give you a few more options than the garbage can, but for the most part I just use the garbage can on the back of the camera because it's a lot faster. You will be able to select and create different folders. For right now, I recommend many users change the playback folder option to all. What's going to happen here is that it's going to look through all the folders on the memory card when you play back images. And this is going to be helpful because if you have taken pictures with another camera that's on a different folder, before you delete that card or reformat the card, you will see what is on that card. There are situations where you want to have two separate folders, for instance, for business and for personal use. And for business, you're showing a slideshow of maybe a home that you're selling. You would only be looking at those pictures and not your kids playing in the backyard. And so you could separate things. But in general, I think most people are just wanting to keep everything and make sure that they don't delete the wrong images. If you want to hide an image in that particular scenario I was just talking about, you can do that. And earlier we were talking about pressing the info button or the, excuse me, the tab on the back of the camera, the multi-controller up and down after you play back an image. And it shows you extra information. And this can be very helpful because it's data about the pictures you shoot. So I would highly recommend going in and checking off probably all of these boxes so that they are options of information that you can check out right after you've taken a picture. And so check them all off and come back out. Now one of the ones that you want to know about in there is what's called highlights. And what happens here is that the camera will blink pixels that are hot that are overexposed, that have received too much light. And it doesn't mean it's a bad picture, but it's a warning that it might have exposure difficulties. And so be very careful with pictures that have lots of highlights that are blinking at you. You may want to double check and make sure you got the right exposure in that case. All right, next up, if you want to make a copy of an image, you could go in here, you would select an image, and then you would make a copy of it. And the main reason that you would want to do this is if you want to copy images between memory cards. For instance, you could have a memory card in your camera, fill it all the way up, stick in a second card, and then copy everything from card one to card two, which is kind of nice because prior to this, you needed a computer to download the images and copy it someplace. And so now you can do all that copying right in camera. Image review, do you want the camera to show you the image after you've taken it? Most people like to leave this set on. If you are doing time-lapse photography, you may want to leave it off for saving power. Uh, for if you're in a really critical battery situation, you could turn it off, but most people like to leave this turned on. After delete, when you delete an image, what image shows up next? And showing next is the logical way to go, so I would leave that set. I think that's the default setting. 
Okay, rotate tall. Here's what happens if you leave rotate tall on. And here's what happens if you leave rotate tall off. It won't rotate images. But it's very easy to rotate the camera. And if you do that, you get a much bigger picture. So I would leave rotate tall off. And you will have to go through the manual trouble of turning the camera vertically. But that's probably the way you just shot the picture. And that's going to give you the best look at your image. I'm not going to go into this, but if you want to do a slideshow, you can hook your camera up to a TV and do a little slideshow. And this goes in and tells you what image and when to start and the frame interval and some other little factors to control your slideshow. Next up, another issue I'm not really going to go into, you can hook your camera directly up to a printer and make prints. You're much better off if you go through a computer because then you can make crops and do adjustments to your image and really refine it and make it just right. But if you want to hook it up to a printer, knock yourself out. You can read about it in the instruction manual where it has about 15 different pages that go over it. Next up, I think we're going to go ahead and dive into the shooting menu. We'll take some questions at the end of the shooting menu. And first up, if you totally like screw up for the next 15 minutes, you come back here and reset the shooting menu to the factory default. Um, but we're going to go ahead and here and change a few things. Number one, we were talking about storage folders a little bit earlier. And if you want to create separate folders for different groupings of images, you could create different folders on different memory cards. Most people just have completely separate memory cards when they really want to separate things. But you can create individual folders on cards. You can control a little bit about the naming of your pictures. The camera usually gives kind of a standard computer generated, generated name to it. But if you want to go ahead and change the three letter code to your initials, you could put your initials on all the file numbers of the pictures that you shoot, uh, which is a good start of an idea. But your pictures should be renumbered when you take them in, store them in your computer. Uh, because it has a counter that goes up to 10,000, and you'll start having repeat file numbers, which is not a good idea. So that's more of a computer issue that you would have, say, with Lightroom, where it imports your pictures and changes the file name. But to start with, you can do a little bit right in camera. Card slot 1 is on top. Card slot 2 is on the bottom. And you get to dictate the different options in here. So let's go through some of the different options. The one I like is Overflow. If you have two memory cards, it stores all the images to one memory card. And then when it's full, it starts sending them to the second memory card. Now, something to be aware of, I think I have my camera here set up on Overflow. And when I look at the number of pictures left, it's only showing me what is in card number one. It doesn't show you how many images are available to put in card number two until it gets there. And so be aware if you stick in two memory cards, that is just the first memory card. The next option is backup, where it sends each image that you shoot to both memory cards. So if you were being hired by a client who was paying you lots of money to take their picture, and they, you wanted to be absolutely certain everything got stored, this would be the safest way to do it. That way it's stored in two locations nearly at the moment of capture, just a moment later. Another option is to shoot RAW and JPEG, but to separate out where the RAWs get sent and where the JPEGs get sent. And so there are some people, for instance, a wedding photographer, for instance, who wants to shoot RAW plus JPEG. It can have separate cards to help separate those images out so they don't have to physically go in and separate them themselves. And so those are the three different options. I like overflow for basic photography. Image quality. Now this is something we've already dealt with. And we saw this on the back of the camera with the quality button. But this is where you can dive in and control it in here. So you're choosing RAW or JPEG. My preference, of course, is to shoot RAW, the NEF, Nikon Electronic Format. If you don't have the software to work with raw images right now, I would at least shoot JPEG fine for most things. There are some times where you may want to record a smaller size raw or a more uh, basic JPEG. But for the most part, you're trying to capture the highest quality image. And that goes along with image size as well, capturing the largest image size. Now, as you can see on screen, I am giving you some recommendations. And the ones in gray 
are what I would call general recommendations for most people. Uh, the red ones will be for more advanced users, uh, and so you'll need to make your own choice. It's your camera. You get to customize it exactly the way you want it. The image sizes we just saw a moment ago, you're going to want to choose large, which is choosing all the pixels on the frame. You bought a 24 megapixel, you probably want to use all of them. All right, we've been talking about the image area, the 1.3 crop. This is where you can change it. There's also the shortcut in the info screen, but you can either choose to shoot the DX area or the 1.3 crop area. Most people are going to want to leave it in the DX area with maybe an occasional switch over to the 1.3x for sports or action photography. Next up, we have JPEG compression. So the JPEG images, and one of the reasons serious photographers don't like JPEG images is because they are compressed. They are throwing some data away in order to save space. And you can choose size priority or optimal quality. And optimal quality is the higher quality method. You're going to get better quality images. The file sizes are slightly larger. They're about 12 megabytes instead of 10 megabytes. But if you want the best quality out of the camera, this is what you will choose, optimal quality. All right, we're going to get a little geeky now. <laughs> All right, uh, for those who are shooting raw, you can actually specify how the raw recording is done. And so here are the options. You can record in 12-bit or 14-bit. You can choose lossless compressed or compressed. And these are the approximate file sizes that you're likely to get from it. And I have been a pretty big proponent of recording everything at the highest possible quality setting on this camera. And I'm actually going to make an exception here. I think 12-bit is probably the better choice than 14-bit and choosing lossless compressed. Now, the reason for 12-bit over 14-bit is I have yet to see or be shown the difference that 14-bit makes. It's one of these things where, in theory, 14-bit supplies more information, and it does. It absolutely does. But that information is either not visible to the human eye, not visible to printers that we use, or not visible on screens that we look at. And so I've done a bunch of testing myself. I can't see how it can help out in any way. I may be wrong. That could be the case. But it doesn't seem to be doing any good. And so that's why I'm choosing 12-bit. Lossless compressed is a little bit higher quality than compressed. And so I'm always generally wanting to get larger quality if I can see any difference at all. And there's a very small difference there. So I think that's kind of the sweet spot to have the raw recording done at. Next up is another duplicate feature that we have seen, which is white balance. We saw this before on the back of the camera with the WB button, but we can dive in here and do the same controls. You can also get in here and have a little bit more specific control. For instance, you see that fluorescent setting? It's got a number four by it. Well, you can actually go in and specify several of the different fluorescent settings. There isn't just one fluorescent setting. There are several fluorescent settings. So you could go in there and control that as well. One of the settings that you can do in here is what's called preset white balance. And this is where you don't know what color the light source is, and you're going to photograph a white object. In this case, I have a white piece of paper under in the photograph, and as you can see, it seems very orange or yellowish. And so what you would do is you would first shoot a photograph of a white piece of paper or a gray object. Anything neutral in color will work. You would select, select preset manual, known as pre. And you would need to select a destination. There are six presets that you can save and you can actually give names to if you work under unusual lighting on a regular basis. And so once you do that, you would select the image and the camera would look at that and it would correct for that image so that you would get correct color under that light source. And so if you work under a number of unusual light sources up to six, you can save those right in your camera as preset white balances. Set picture control. All right, this, you might say, is the modern day equivalent of shooting Fuji film or Kodak film or Agfa film. You have a slightly different look to your images. Now, this only applies to people who are shooting JPEG images. If you shoot raw image, 
This doesn't matter because you're getting the original information. But if you want to have a little bit more vivid look to your landscape photographs, you could adjust vivid here. And that would make your pictures for landscape probably look a little bit better. Once again, I think you're much better off downloading to a computer, looking at it, and making small adjustments there. But if you just don't like the way the JPEGs look, you can go in here and adjust it. I think it's just probably best just to leave it on standard or perhaps neutral as just a simple baseline setting so that you can make adjustments from there. Manage Picture Control allows you to get very nerdy. If you want to create your own look to your images, you can do that. Now it is going to do that to all of the images until you go into man Manage Picture Control and change it, but it's just like the picture settings we were talking about, but those are presets. Now what you can do is you can go in and set the contrast level, the saturation, and some other factors exactly the way you think it would look good. And so if you're shooting JPEGs and you don't like the way the JPEGs look, this might be a solution for you. The color space. If you shoot in RAW, you get the largest color space possible called Adobe RGB. If you shoot in JPEG, you start off at sRGB, and if you want, you can change it to Adobe RGB. If you plan to do any sort of printing or color manipulation or working on your images, you want to be in Adobe RGB. If you're just shooting really basic pictures with your camera and you're just printing directly from your camera, not doing anything, you could leave it in sRGB. But for the more serious user, I would say you want to be in Adobe RGB, which I think is where most people will want to be. Next up on the camera is something called Active D-Lighting. And we have a number of options in here where we can let the camera figure things out. We can turn it on high, no, low, normal. And it's probably easier to show you with some visuals as to what this means here. So in this image, the shadows are a little dark and we might want to see a little bit more information in the shadows. If we turn on Active D-Lighting, one of the things that it does on a regular basis, like this, is it lightens up the shadows a little bit. It also plays a little bit with the highlights as well to make sure they're not overblown. And so in this particular scenario, I prefer the standard look where it has lightened up the shadows. But before you turn this on standard or some other setting like this, be aware that not every image you shoot looks better with the shadows lightened up. Sometimes images look better that are nice and contrasty. And so my feeling is, is that I would prefer to just plain old leave this turned off. I don't want my camera playing games with how light and dark the image should be in that case. And so if you shoot raw, this doesn't matter. Once again, it's not going to be working. It's only if you're in JPEGs. If you plan to do no post-processing, you want everything done in camera, you could try it on normal, you could try it on low and see if you like it. Uh, but for anyone who wants to work with their images later and have as much information to work with, I would just leave it off because anything that the camera can do, you can do better in the computer uh, with more exact detail and with particularities to each individual image that you might want to change it to. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range, and it is where the camera will combine a number of pictures and in this case, the camera will take two images, a brighter image and a darker image, and it will combine those two images into a single JPEG image. Can't do a RAW, it only combines it to a JPEG image. And I'm not real impressed. It's, uh, it does it, but there are other programs out there. Uh, Photo, uh, Photomatix, I believe, is the number one program out there that most HDR shooters are working with. And that program is very, very good, allows you virtually infinite control compared to what's available in camera. It does do it. Play around with it. See if you like it or not. Use it accordingly. Next up is something called auto distortion control. And here is the advantage of buying a Nikon lens and putting it on a Nikon camera. All lenses have a little bit of distortion to them. And Nikon knows how bad their lenses are and they build a program into their cameras. So if you shoot JPEG images, not RAW, shoot JPEG images, it'll fix that distortion. So as an example, you can see the horizon line in this photograph is slightly bendy. And I'll just switch back and forth, and you can see when we straighten that image up, 
the horizon becomes straight. And so it's pretty rare that we ever want distortion in our photographs. If we do, we generally buy a fisheye lens. So this is one of the few things that I would leave turned on. Now, it doesn't help you out when you shoot RAWs, but it will help you out when and where you shoot JPEGs. So leave that one on. Long exposure noise reduction and high ISO noise reduction are both in-camera noise reduction where the camera is trying to reduce the amount of noise. So in this visual, you know that low ISO is the way to go for best image quality. With, with high ISO, you get noise. And there are two reasons why you get noise, actually. High ISOs, like ISO 3200, 6400. And also, if you leave the shutter open for longer than one second, you're going to start to get some noise because the sensor heats up at that period of time. And so that's why there's both long exposure and high ISO noise reduction. Well, the camera will go in and try to fix the problem. And in general, it does a reasonably good job. Uh, but sometimes the processing of it takes a little while and you're not able to shoot the next picture. And you can always do a better job if you want to get in and do, do the work yourself. For instance, in Adobe's Lightroom, it has a very easy slider that you can control the noise with. And so for most cases, I recommend turning this off uh, just because it'll, you're still going to get the same good quality image, but you may need to do the adjustment later on, but you'll be able to make a better quality adjustment later on. The ISO sensitiv sensitivity settings is the same as the ISO button on the back of the camera, but it also has extra controls in here. So you can change from 100 to 6400, but this is where you would go in to change the maximum sensitivity. And so if you want to get up to that 12,800 or 25,600, you could change the maximum sensitivity up and down. You can also turn on the auto ISO control here. And this is where you can also choose what shutter speed your camera will start changing the ISO at. Let's just say with a normal lens on your camera, you can handhold that down to about a 60th of a second. And anything below a 60th of a second, your camera bumps up the ISO to compensate. Well, one of the cool things about the minimum shutter speed adjustment here is that you can set it to auto. And what happens there is the camera looks at what lens you have and adjusts the shutter speeds according to lenses. So if you have a 300 millimeter lens, it'll start adjusting sooner, like at, IS, uh, at shutter speed 250, which can really help, you, help out in many situations. And so, a minimum shutter speed of auto might be good, or you might want to specifically set a certain number. And as far as the maximum sensitivity, I often raise that up to high two. I don't use high two really ever, but it's always nice to have it available as an option, as is the low setting. Next up, if you happen to purchase the remote control that we talked about, you can control exactly how it works. Uh, one option would be a two second delay. This is good if you're going to get in the picture because then you would press the button and you have two seconds to hide it in the palm of your hand. You could be using this for some sort of maybe wildlife photography. Maybe the camera's up by a bird feeder and when you hit the quick response, it fires the picture at exactly the time that you press the shutter release. Or you could be using it for the rem remote mirror up. So you press it once to lock the mirror up and once again to fire the shutter. So those are all three different options. Choose it how you use it if you own it. Multiple exposures, eh, this is a little gimmicky to me. Uh, if you want to take two pictures and have them on the same frame, it used to be a trick we used to do with film by not advancing the film. Well, you can do the same thing in camera here. It just takes two pictures. You can either take two or three pictures. There's also something called gain where the camera is basically adjusting the ISO to accommodate for multiple exposures because you're having two exposures on the same frame. You can play around, have some fun in the field. You can also do this by just taking single pictures into Photoshop and creating layers. But if you don't have Photoshop, this is a way to do it right in camera. John, before we leave this page sure. of the menu, um, someone asked in the chat room, when I try to put auto distortion control to on, my camera is telling me that the option is not available at the current settings or in the camera's current state. Do you know what could be wrong? It's possible that they might have their camera in RAW. It's possible they might have a non-Nikon lens on their camera. 
I'm going to make a quick adjustment in here. So I'm shooting raw. And actually, I'll do this so people can see it. Hard for me, but easy for you. And so they were not able to get to the sensi maximum sensitivity, or what was it? No, the distortion control. Distortion control, I'm sorry. Do, 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 do. Let's jump back up. Auto distortion control. I can get to that. They have done something. What have they done? What are the other options that they could have done that would not allow that? It's definitely not available with non-Nikon lenses. So that okay. would be the first and easy thing. I'm trying to think. There's a few things that are not available. Like right now, HDR is not available, okay. as you can see in my camera, because I have the camera set to RAW. And let's actually. So if you're watching out there, maybe they could try uh, using a Nikon lens and putting it on JPEG setting, and then let us know, would that work? Yeah, let me see if there's anything else. Actually, not white balance. I'm going to try one other thing here, just changing it to JPEG, large JPEG, go back into the menu, and auto distortion is still available. I got HDR now. We have news in from the chat rooms. What's that? <laughs> she said it is a non Nikon lens. So Good, I was right. So <laughs> you were totally right. Good to know. Was, it can be a number of things, and it's lucky when it's the first thing you guess. And thank you for letting us know. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, good. Good. Um, All right. Do you want? Would you like me to ask some questions about this menu, or, or do yes, you want to keep going? Yes. Go right ahead. Good okay. time for it. Um, let's see here. We have Pixel Chick saying, "What did he say to set the minimum shutter speed under ISO sensitivity?" If you are going to be using the auto ISO, mm -hmm. a reasonably good safe option is to leave the minimum shutter speed at auto. If you have specific number that you feel comfortable hand holding the camera at, for instance, let's say I think I'm really steady and I can hold the camera to a fifteenth of a second, you could bump it all the way down to a fifteenth of a second. Um, but the auto setting accommodates different lenses and adjusts for different lenses, which is nice. Okay. Excellent. And Blackhawk John asks question for John. <laughs> Another John. Is there any way other than reformatting to delete the RAW and the JPEG files at the same time in the playback mode? Mm. If you shoot a RAW plus a JPEG and you delete it, you will be deleting both of them at the same time. Okay. So you don't have to look for both of them. They're only going to show up once when you play them back. Okay. And I believe you covered this briefly, but it's, Pixel Chick asks, if you are on RAW, there's no cho choice for image size. Is that correct? No. Well, yes and no. Okay, so no, there isn't a specific size. With Canon, they have, for instance, small, medium, large RAWs. With Nikon, you do have the choice of 12-bit to 14-bit, lossless, compressed, and compressed. And those are the ways that you can adjust the file size. The raw image is 24 megapixels in every case. OK. All right. And we need one more question. Uh, Edu underscore BR asks, what happens if I choose overflow? two cards, and after the card number one is full, I remove it from the camera or, and leave number two where it was, or how does that work? It's at, in overflow, it's just going to go to the next available card. OK, just naturally. Is, just naturally. Okay. And just, just out of, for quick reference, I'll do this. So right now, I'm going to card number one, but I do have two cards in there. I'm going to take out card number one. I'm going to place it on the desk in front of me, and it's just going to card number two. I can take card number two, put it into card slot number one, put card number two in card number one and card slot number two. And it's still all going back into one and will overflow into two. So it always starts with one. If it's not there or if it's full, it goes to number two.